commercial or religious perspective, where, and particularly a theistic perspective, where they're talking about God as the fundamental cause of all being. So everything in the universe basically derives from God's consciousness, and in that regard, uh, then we really can think about the universe as being more a, a state of consciousness or more uh, inundated with consciousness, much more so than the material reality that we normally look at. So going back to the idea of what really is consciousness, it really depends on a person's perspective. If somebody wants to be a very materialistic scientist, somebody may say, well, it's just the functioning of the human brain that allows us to be self-aware or aware of our surroundings that allows us to get around the world and survive. The only problem with that is that it's still very difficult to explain how a, a mass of neurons and, and, and cells and so forth can ultimately become aware of itself and why it is that if you put the same stuff together in another way or you take a huge uh, supercomputer with millions of circuits all running at incredible speeds and so forth, that why that doesn't have consciousness. And we don't know the answer to that just yet. And why it seems, at least at this point, that human beings seem to be at least the greatest source of consciousness in, the, in, in, our, in our world. Are you saying, so that I understand, yes. that when we're in an absolute unitary state, that is more reality than this out here? Well, that's how it's described by the people who have it. And that's really been shown across the board. It, there are many different kinds. It doesn't even have to be an absolute unitary state, but a very strong mystical experience. People who have near-death experiences, people who have spontaneous mystical experiences, people who have been meditating for many years and get a sense of enlightenment or some type of mystical uh, experience as the result of that practice. All of those different types of experiences, even if it doesn't go to the extreme of just everything being wiped out and, and having an absolute sense of oneness, uh, these very powerful mystical experiences are perceived to represent a truer form of reality, a more fun fundamental level of reality that makes this material world really not mean as much. And you know, some people have described it as an illusion, which I think is sometimes a little strong, but, but I think the point they're trying to make is, is that it just doesn't have the, the realness, the quality of realness that these states have. And the, the ultimate goal of the mystic then, once they've had that experience, is to kind of keep trying to get back to that experience, because that is, in, in their eyes, what represents the fundamental level of reality. So then what is reality? I mean, basically, you've got to just answer that, really. I mean. Well, what reality is, is, is a, a, that's the, the kind of the crux of the question. When we've looked at the, how we define reality as, as a human being, we looked at the criteria of which we evaluate reality and say, well, what is, what is it that makes something real? I mean, there were philosophers in the past that said, look, if I, if I kick a rock and I, and I hurt my toe, that's real. You know, I feel that. It, it feels real. It's vivid. And uh, that, re that means that it's reality. Uh, but it's still an experience, and it's still this person's perception of it being real. So that's certainly one characteristic, which is that it feels real. We bump into things in the real world, uh, we hear things, we hear sirens and so forth, and, and they all sound and feel and appear very vivid, very real to us. They are also consistent. They, you know, if we see a car driving down the street, it just doesn't disappear. It keeps going, there's a consistency over time. And we have a sense that when something no longer is there, that it has now ceased to exist in that reality. Uh, and we also can do a cross comparison. I can ask you, what do you see over there? And you say, I see a blue car. And I say, I see a blue car. That, that cross references me. And I can say, OK, that represents reality. The problem is, is that if we actually look at all of those criteria about cross referencing and persistence over time and, and the, the feeling of it being real, all of those still ultimately come back to how real it feels to us. Because when I cross reference with somebody, they're part of my reality. So it's still a matter of if I hear somebody agreeing with what I think is going on out there, it still has to do with, with what I am perceiving and whether or not what I perceive uh, is ultimately what I interpret as being real. So when, when, when we try to break it down, it, it appears that, that reality ultimately comes down to our experience, to the strength at which we, we sense it. And one of the things that is very important, I think, in terms of evaluating reality is how it compares to our other experiences of reality. So for example, if we have a dream at night, it may seem very real and very vivid. But when we wake up, we usually say, you know what, that was a dream. It's not, it doesn't have that same persistence, it doesn't have that same quality that this reality has. Even though when you're in it, it may feel very real, when you're in 
this reality, that reality seems secondary. So in many ways, reality can be very relative. And then, of course, when people have a mystical experience, that feels very real. And at that point, they feel that that's more real. But the interesting thing there is that even though they may not be in that mystical experience anymore, when they're in this baseline reality, they still think that that reality was more real. So it's different than the dream state where we say that wasn't real, because now we're saying it still feels more real, even though I don't have any connection to it right now. I still know that that was more real. And, and we see that time and time again. Even people who are not designed to be mystics, people with near-death experiences, always describe that that experience, that sense that they had, the feelings that they had with that, were, are more real, that makes this reality a whole different situation for them. And, and it's been documented in many studies that have shown that when people have a near-death experience, it changes their, their perspective on life, their fear of death, their interpersonal relationships, how they approach their life, how they approach their jobs, their children, their family. So it has very dramatic effects, speaking to the fact that it really felt very real and really had a life-changing consequence for them.